Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. So here we are. It's the summer of 2011. We're at a time that investors are running here, foreign investors, local investors, REITs. Everybody wants to come to New York City and buy real estate. And the interesting phenomenon is that there's a lot of money by certain lenders to provide these investors financing on these real estate. So I've assembled four of the most prominent real estate lenders to provide their insight on the state of the market. My guests today include John T. Adams, the first senior vice president and mortgage officer for New York Community Bank, Melissa Farrell, the managing director of Prudential Mortgage Capital, David McNeil, the managing director for Decca Bank, and last but not least, a man who I consider the dean of commercial bank financing, my good friend, Bill McCahill, the executive vice president at Capital One Bank. So Capital One is a bank, even though you know, I, I, went on, I went to Europe and I got my venture card because I didn't have to pay the 3% uh, financing. So right. what are you doing these days? Venture card is the best deal going. We're, we're, we're doing a lot. We're, we're doing pretty much of a, uh, I would say, a mixed bag of, uh, of lending, uh, going from uh, multifamily, stabilized properties, doing seven to ten year financings on those. We're doing some turnaround type situations. We're doing lines of credit to opportunity funds and REITs. Ooh, wait, wait a second. Did I hear you say you're give, doing lines of credit to opportunity funds? Security. REITs? So how, how is it secured? Secured by properties that they own. Oh, so they're not unsecured lines. Of they're not really unsecured. Some are technically unsecured, but there's a group of properties segregated to are back you, up the line. Are you doing financing for subscription lines? Yes, we are. So we, and we're also doing some construction lending, mostly on multifamily. So you like city. multifamily. Yep. And what are the guys from Germany like? We are very focused in markets. Six markets in the U.S., Seattle, L.A., San Francisco, Boston, New York, D.C., and three product types within those markets, office primarily, retail, and hospitality. So we are focused of larger projects, core assets, very good sponsors, so you know, larger what, tickets. What, what size? I mean, could I come to you with a $5 million loan, $10 million loan? Our, our, our minimum is probably $50 million, and our sweet spot is $100 million, and that's uh, my targeted hold is near $100 million. So can I underwrite above that? I can underwrite above that if I feel very confident I'll get back down to 100 on a final hold basis. So we're looking 
particularly at the larger. So, so, uh, so would one somebody say that you're looking at the trophy offices, Class A? Would you look at a B office building? We'd look at a B office building in an A location. Never a B office building in a B location. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll go A and B as long as we're in the right place. So what about that small little company called Prudential? How much did you lend last year, company-wide? Company-wide, uh, we were about $8.8 billion, uh, looking to hopefully do a little bit more than that in 2011. And what do you want to do this year? I mean, I heard him. You know, he has a limitation. Super, super, super. Okay, in six markets, what do, what do you want to do? Well, I think when people think of Prudential, they think usually of the larger loans, but we have a minimum size of about $10 million for our life company. So we do the 15s, the 30s, you know, you know we like to do the 50 to 100 million. You know, I think a couple of years ago, I think when Dave was on the show, he mentioned that you had done a lot of small deals even a couple of years ago, that where the average size was maybe four or five million. Yeah, I don't know if it was that small, but you know, probably 13, 14 million on average. And I think people think of us as being a kind of higher average. Level. And how long? I mean, Bill said he's going seven to 10 years but mostly for multifamily on the seven to 10. How far will Prudential finance? How well, our minimum term is five, and we're fixed rate lenders, and we'll go 10, 15, you know, we're putting out money, 20 year money. We've quoted some 25, 25s lately. People like where rates are and want to kind of lock it up for the long term. And you, that small little $41.2 billion community bank that everybody says, who, where'd you come out of? I mean, I know who you are, but you know, McNeil asked me the question of who is New York Community Bank. Yeah, you, you know, you're, you're, you're a guy who's in a lot of markets, and you've done rather well. We are, and you know, you hit the uh, nail right on the head when you said Community Bank. So in as much as a sweet spot for us would be you know, the 10 to $15 million range, we definitely consider the two, $3 million deals because a large part of our business is relationship as well. So we have many, many repeat customers, borrowers, who have portfolios, 10, 15, 50, 60 properties. And we're you know, fortunate enough to have a good chunk of them in our portfolio. Some of them range in size from $3 million, you know, per building. Some of them go up to anywhere from 15, 20 million. So, so here's the big question that, you know, Bill and I know you for a period of time. David didn't know. Where do you come out and you, you became a, you know, for selected properties, a major lender on office buildings. How did how, the bank get involved with that? Well, obviously for us to really be you know, productive and, and give a good return, we have to put the dollars out. That's where I think most of us are making our money is, is lending. We have money to lend, and you're not going to get there simply by doing the three, $5 million deals. You've got to put out some, some larger, well-thought-out uh, pr production, and we were fortunate enough to be submitted a couple of requests for some well-located trophy assets in Manhattan. They were being acquired with a ton of equity going in ahead of us. They really, when you really peeled it back, it was a slam dunk deal. You really, unless the whole economy goes totally into a downward spin, it's the type of assets that we've lent on that were low leverage, cash in front, with great sponsorships and great location with good upside. So you know, we t grabbed the opportunity, the opportunity was there, we grabbed it. Do you, do you see yourself continuing to look at the office market? I think we will continue to look at uh, the office market in solid locations to solid sponsors on conservative deals. So in a way, like David was saying, he has six cities, you, you, you probably, would you look at an office deal you think, like in New Jersey? We would consider it. Um, it has to, you know, meet all the uh, uh, Lipnitz test, but yeah, we would look at that. You know, Manhattan is really the, if we're going to, you know, be aggressive with office, or when I say aggressive, go into that market. Right, not aggressive, make an investment. Make in an that, investment. Because the way you did uh, 1330 was a very conservative loan, right. you know, there was a lot of equity, and the other pro properties, the, the significant amount of equity in the deals. And one advantage we have, uh, I think, is our turnaround. I mean, we did 1330 in a matter of three weeks. You know, that had it was a year-end closing, and it was, I think, the second week of December. We were approached with it. We jumped all over it, and I think we funded December 24th, Christmas Eve. So here's my question, and John, you know, which is an interesting thing. Someone was saying to me, I'm not sure, maybe it was Billy and I, or maybe you and I were on the phone, saying that it's taking longer to take deals. 
I mean, three weeks turnaround is really you know, very special. I think you were saying, or somebody said it was taking 60, 90 days to get deals done these days. Well, I don't know if it was. The closing. Yeah, I don't know if it was me that said that, but uh, it probably was, because we, we have a series of deals right now that uh, seem to be stuck as far as closing. And most of it, it has to do in the fact that there's no critical date. There's no acquisition. It's just a, either a refinance or someone who's taken money out of the property or what have you. Uh, so there's no critical date, and deals tend to uh, sit when that when that happens. You also have rate watchers. Yeah, the ones watching watching the rates. You know, you could have approved and committed that's, a deal. At, that's also very true. You know, 50 basis points higher than where you are today. And if you want to keep yep. the deal from leaving, because someone might be worth it for them to leave whatever money they have on the table with you to go elsewhere, if they're going to get 50 basis points less. So people are watching rates without a doubt, and they're holding off on closing until they see if rates are going to go down more, they're going to settle. You, you know, you can hedge, but sometimes, you know, before he was with a German bank, he was with, you know, Wells Fargo, who's probably one of the most aggressive. I mean, you can't, as one would say, it's difficult to, to eat your cake and wait and everything to, to do that. I mean... No, oh, from a lender standpoint, we want you to close now. Because, I mean, if we were 25, 50 basis points higher than where you'd come out today right. on a Rates product, go both ways. Absolutely. They do. But you yeah. know what? We've historically, right now, for the, you know, over the past 6, 12 months, they've been down. You know, they really haven't seen them bounce back up. I know every time we look at rates, we seem to we need to adjust downward, not upward. And that's been, you know, the trend for at least the past few months. What do you so see, we, we're seeing people looking, er, starting earlier in the refinance process. So that's, I think, part of the reason why it's taking longer because people, you know, are not just, oh, we're 60 days out, let's go, you know, get a loan. Now they're 120 or, you know, 180 days out because of what, you know, running into the issues in the last couple of years where it took a lot longer to find the financing. We're, all, we're seeing a lot more forward commitments. A lot of people coming to ask us, well, my loan doesn't mature for nine months. Will you do a nine month forward? Will you do a 12 month forward? And so I have to say, you know, a significant amount of business we're looking at right now is for forwards. Now, didn't I hear maybe with you a number of borrowers are coming to you, you know, as opposed to the forward concept, saying, you know, I have a prepayment or something like that, maybe a renegotiate earlier? You know, typically when you have the repricing arm, you know, our good standard product for us is a five and a five or a seven and five. So when you're coming up, near the end of your fifth year and there's still some time left with a prepayment penalty. Yeah, we've been asked to take a look at modifying the rate for the remaining term. Will we forego on a prepayment penalty? Typically not, but we do factor that into when we how we consider the reprice rate because really they are locking in sooner than they would have had to if they waited for their maturity date and chances are the repricing option that was built into their, their loan docs and, and versus today's rate is higher. So it's worth it for them to even pay a penalty as long as they know that they're locking in the rate at you know, 50, 100 basis points less than where they would have if they just let it roll. You Plus know, you, can keep the, you can keep the loan on your books keep versus loan losing the loan on your That's books, right. which the is last thing you want to do. runoff is unbelievable. Putting, putting, right putting a loan out that was been performing and try to find a new home for it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, I mean, you Not lose easy. a $200 million loan, it's... it's it's painful. <laughs> it's, 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 hard, it's hard to find a new $200 so, so, million loan. It's a know, killer when you get one of those paid you, off. You know, I, I'm hearing, you know, residential, residential, residential. You don't like residential. That's not in your cup of tea. The first market that did poorly in the, in the Great Recession, as we would say, was the hospitality. And the first one that's improving is the hospitality to really higher levels. What's your thought about the hospitality market today? You, you've been around the business many years. I mean, uh, are banks getting back to lend on new construction? Uh, because as somebody said to me, they're seeing more and more deals on hospitality, and, you know, they don't have track records. You know, hospitality is each day you've got to have a new customer. You know, it's like a restaurant. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a couple of opportunities in Manhattan. And we'll probably be moving ahead with one on 57th Street with uh, uh, Gary Barnett and, and Hyatt. Uh, but we do like what's what we see in the hotel market today. I mean, room rates are really picking up. Occupancy is picking up, and it seems like you know, New York is 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 a favorite destination internationally now, and we don't see that changing in the near future. So we're pretty confident. 
about hotels. David? No, I, we, we don't do construction, but I think we're, we're seeing an uptick on all the markets we look at in hotels. And I think you're finding the ones that weren't doing quite as good, either getting a recap, getting a new equity partner in, deleveraging and looking for longer term debt. So we're, we're quoting on a few. And now, are you quoting on uh, limited service or are they three star, four star? I we're, mean, we're probably full service. And, and better. I think we're we're not doing any limited service in, in those core markets: L.A., San Francisco, New York, Washington D.C. Melissa Prudential, over the years, at one time was a major owner of hotels, mm -hmm. going back maybe 20, 25 years. I mean, they owned a lot of the Hilton hotels over there. What's the appetite today of Prudential on existing hotels? Which type of hotels? And if you would do, do you do any construction? We, today, we would not be looking at doing construction on hotels. I think we would look at, like you said, kind of a stabilized hotel that's been been operating, look at last three years of operations. I think the disconnect we're having, in, and we are seeing a lot of hotels for financing these days, is that people are still underwriting pro forma because the market is kind of on the up, uptick. And so for us, we still underwrite kind of in place trailing 12. And so if we can make a loan work at a 55% leverage on the in place trailing 12, then I think that's a hotel deal that we would like to do. Two questions. You're not really doing hotels, am I correct? You are correct. But the other question is, here was the problem that happened in the last recession. Many lenders, especially the securitized lenders, were lending on futures. They were saying that the office building, I mean, you did it yourself, and it's worked out on 200 uh, Fifth Avenue. People were saying, hey, the market is doing well, and I'm going to get... X dollars in rent. How are you looking at an office building today? Are you looking at it with the current rent or are you listening to the developer who's saying, you know, I'm going to get $100 a square foot for rent, which, you know, maybe happen in cl certain buildings in Manhattan, but it's not going to happen on a B building or something like that. How, how do you underwrite a, an office building today? No, we're definitely looking at current rents. I mean, we're not putting in any escalation really at all over and above what we see in today's market. Dave? I think you could almost do it. Uh, if you've got over market rents, we're, we're taking rents down to market. So I yep. think we're looking at a stabilized run rate on actual rental rates today. I think with the thought, you know, I think real estate lenders are always have to be a little bit optimistic, but I do think you're going to get up to Developers are always optimistic. Well, we, we try to be a little less optimistic than the developers. But, you know, I think you, you look at Manhattan and you look at just the scarcity of supply and we're going to have to build some new buildings. And even if you're in the ground today, you're, you're three years before you deliver a building. So I think you're going to have some nice, you know, positive, you know, rental rates happen, but we're not, you know, kind of taking the jump. And thinking we're at 50% loan to value based on future rents when you're really maybe at 70% loan to value on today's rent. So I think we're today. Melissa? Well, we look at it very similarly. I think we will write down the rents. We also kind of look at on average across the building because if you're writing some down and some are lower, you kind of average them across and say, do I feel comfortable over time that this is the rent this building can kind of maintain? And since you've done close to a billion dollars in office buildings, how are you looking at it? Well, obviously, the going in cash flow is something that uh, we don't ignore, but also we'll also look at a break even. You know, okay, so we're at a 130 coverage, 140, whatever it is, depending on that particular asset. But what would it take for the rents to drop for us to still break even? Um, it's definitely a factor that we like to put into our equation when we're underwriting a deal. You know, if you're at eighty, hundred dollars a square foot, does it work at fifty? Uh, if you took the whole building to fifty, and are you still covering your expenses? Are you still covering your debt service? So break-even is important, but we don't really look at the uh, uh, building as being $100 a square foot, like 1330. They c they are getting $100 a square foot on new leases. I mean, it's it's given. We've seen the, no question. We've seen the leases, but if the whole building has to go to 50, does it work? And it does. So uh, you know, uh, we we do look at a, a break-even, worst-case scenario type of analysis. Let, let's leave the Manhattan centric. What do you think of the boroughs? What do you think of New Jersey? I mean, you had just mentioned you just approved the deal in Cherry Hill. I mean, how, how do you, uh, you, it's not the top six cities, you don't know about that. You, you, you're here, but you're not here for this discussion. How do you, I mean, your region is, is rather large. I mean, what's the prudential? Do you like all over? Are there any? We do. I think it varies by property type. I'm multifamily. We like all over. Uh, grocery anchored, we like in many cases. Um, when it gets to office, we like to stick with, you know, kind of primary, you know, Manhattan office. You don't think you do a Brooklyn office building? Um, at the, you know, it's always at the right leverage point with the right sponsor. We would consider, you know, many different things, but yeah. I'd say overall in general, we prefer to stick in New York, 
DC, you know, San Francisco. John T. As far as true CRE deals, um, we like to keep them in our in our backyard. You know, the the, the boroughs, primarily Manhattan. As far as the multifamily product, you know, Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, obviously New York and the boroughs, Long Island. I have a question, and you know, it's 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 been written up recently, and I've seen it. A lot of companies, especially in renewals today, are not are, are taking their data processing offsite. So there's a lot of data centers. Have, have you seen uh, requests for financing of these data centers where you don't have to worry about parking because there's nobody really work there? You know, you can have a 100,000 square foot data center where 10 people are involved with it. Have, have you seen that, Bill? Yeah, we have. And we've looked at a few deals and honestly, we have not done any. Uh, they're a little difficult to get comfortable with because you look at the size of the machines that they have in these buildings you know, and I keep thinking back to the old days when computers first came around, they were huge monsters. And now they're about this big, you know, and we're, we're just a little concerned about the technology that may change in the next five or 10 years. And what would that mean for this building? So uh, you're afraid maybe that totally, if, if, it, if it cuts down from this size to this size, you know, right. they won't even need that much space. They won't need that much space. Melissa? We've done a few data centers, but typically it has an alternative use. It's, a, it's an industrial building that's been converted. Um, so we look at the, what the alternate use is. T typically we put tighter amortization on them so that we can get our loan per square foot down to a level we'd feel comfortable at on a typical industrial deal in that market. John? Maybe if they were a tenant, but not the tenant. Otherwise it would so probably So you're work. not saying a standalone, which is what I really yeah. was talking to Melissa. Right. And right would probably back away if it was a standalone. Now, now retail, uh, I mean, urban retail, you know, has done well, but you know, some of the retail has not done well, you know, and we were talking prior to the show, you know, at one time there was record stores like Sam Goody, at one time, as you were saying before, video there were video stores like Blockbuster, uh, and there were even bookstores. I mean, what, what's happened to the bookstores, you know, we're really down to, um, Barnes and Nobles and maybe a few more borders. Same thing happened with linens and things. How do you look at retail, you know, and the circuit cities and all the rest? How do you look at retail who have the Bed Bath and Beyond or the or you know the the PC Richards or or an electronics because of the the nature of the internet and so on? Well, the, the first thing I think that we look at which is something that uh, Milton Cooper taught me a long, long time ago, is look at the sales per square foot. Uh, because if that is very, very high, much higher than average, it's got to be a great location. So if the tenant goes into bankruptcy or whatever, it's going to be pretty easy to replace them. And uh, I think that that's uh, rule number one. Then, like Prudential, we like to stay in the suburbs with the uh, grocery anchor type center. Uh, and... We like uh, urban retail where there's a lot of foot traffic. John? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I mirror the responses um, as well. But again, it's location, and it's, it, we definitely look at sales per square foot. I mean, no doubt. Um, is it our prime product? No. But is it in our portfolio? Yeah, but we're going to be probably, you know, 65%. We're not going to be too aggressive. You know, we're going to look for strong coverage, but we're also going to look at term of lease. Um, you know, you could even have uh, a store that goes out, but they're still you know, required to pay on the, on the lease. That's as long as they haven't filed for bankruptcy. As long as they haven't filed for bankruptcy, like our friends at A&P. But even the A&P uh, locations, not all of them shut down. A lot of them are very good, yeah. well-ran stores. You know, it's, it all comes down to location and competition that's around. Who, speaking of competition, you know, in the, t the the period from let's say 2001 to 2005, we had new competitors. We had Chorus. We had Fremont. We had all of these gung ho people who were lending 80, 90 percent. Do we see any of these new players, or is it quiet? I mean, we don't have. There are very few German lenders still left in the market. Am I right, David? Mm -hmm. A couple notable ones missing now. So what, what's happening? Have the lenders become more disciplined? Uh, or what do you see? 
Well, I think so far the lenders have become more disciplined. I mean, I, I haven't seen any outliers come into the market like like a chorus that's uh, you know going to do a two hundred million dollar construction loan at eighty percent leverage. Uh, that we just haven't seen that yet uh, in, in the marketplace. So, I mean, I do think that the credit criteria is pretty close between all of the active uh, lenders in today's market. A little bit difference on slightly on pricing. We'll, but what we'll I was saying to you prior to the deal. show is all of you, David and every all four of you, are shopping the same deal, mm -hmm. the good yeah. deal. So what happens to the deal that has a little hair? I think it goes to CMBS. I think CMBS is a is, is a market that, you know, it's a smaller loans in tertiary and secondary markets, and I think they're, that they take most of that kind of business. But look at all the bad loans that they made in CMBS when they did 27, you know, $270 billion of loans. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the problem. And as long as the CMBS player takes no risk and sells the bonds, as I used to say to Big Rob Verone, I said, you're a bookmaker. And you sell the risk. But who's going to take that place? You're saying it's the CMBS player. I think they're active. They're out. They're active. And they're, 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 writing, they're writing plenty of loans right JT? now. JT? I think there's a product and a home for everything. I think it depends on how you structure it and how you underwrite it. You know, the deal that has a little bit of hair, perhaps you're not, you're not as aggressive on dollars. You still do your homework, you know, finding out who's behind the deal and what's going on around it. As long as, you know, the past history hasn't been, you know, that negative by way of repayment or foreclosures that are in the closet or bankruptcies. T to quote the dean, you still look at the old C's of credit, right? Absolutely. Yep. So as we say, 30 minutes are over, and I'd like to thank all of you providing your insight, and hopefully that all of you be back when I start the 11th season September. I'd like to thank John T. Adams, Melissa Farrell, David McNeil, and Bill McHale. See you next week. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickoff Group, Urban American.